You know, I think all of us want to be useful to the Lord. Uh, all of us want to have an effective and fruitful life and serve the Lord uh, in whatever sphere of influence or scope of control that we might be able to be blessed with, whatever we're blessed with, that within that, within that, that scope, within that sphere, that the Lord would find us faithful and will bless us in that. I think when we come today to this next psalm, when we come to, um, uh, let me change my screen here, Psalm 5, uh, I think what we find is that the um, Lord is giving us instruction. He's giving us guidance. Sorry, I'm a little distracted there. I'm changing scenes here. Lord is a little uh, uh, um, instructing us on who is the one that God uses. Who is the one that God will allow to serve, or use to serve in his, in his, in his church today? Uh, for David's time, it was within Israel and in the temple. So I've called this psalm, Who is the One God Uses? And the psalm answers that, as we'll see as we walk through it. This psalm is a little bit longer uh, than the ones we've had before. It's 12 verses, so I'm not going to go through every verse, but I think you'll see once we get to the uh, explanation area, we're going to draw from the whole uh, psalm in order to explain it. But again, uh, just to reinforce this, I won't be coming back to this all the time, but this uh, here, uh, this title, uh, Prayer of Protection from the Wicked, that's from the editor. Your Bible may have something different, may have nothing. Uh, it may have another title. That's an editor's note trying to help you understand it better. This is part of the Bible text. This is part of the uh, text itself. Uh, for the choir director, for flute accompaniment. Uh, again, the idea here is that it's uh, instrumental. There's an instrument that goes with this. I know some churches, don't mean to step on too many toes here, but I know some churches uh, worship without music. They insist that uh, for the New Testament church, we don't use music, but certainly we can say that for Israel at least, in the example we have in the book of Psalms, is that these were accompanied by musical instruments. So, as we get into this, uh, we see David crying out to the Lord. So we're actually listening in on David's prayer here. It's really a privilege to be able to do this, I think. It says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Hear the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like you just come before God with just groaning, with crying? Sometimes those are the hardest times to come before the Lord uh, when we are just can do nothing but groan and cry before him. Uh, sometimes it's, it seems like uh, we're almost ashamed to go to the Lord in such an um, emotional turmoil. But I think with David's example here, we're encouraged to do that. We're encouraged to bring that before the Lord. And look at this verse 3 here. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. Right first thing in the day. You know, I encourage people to take time in the morning to be in God's word. And I often hear, well, I'm not a morning person. I really uh, can't handle it in the morning. And let me tell you a secret. No one is a morning person. Uh, there are no morning people. There are people who perhaps wake up and wake up quickly, but uh, no one's a morning person. It's a discipline, and I encourage you as we go through the Psalms this year to get up a little early. Uh, enjoy the quietness of the home, uh, perhaps before your spouse gets up, before the needs of the day start to intrude, uh, before the Children are running around. I know my daughter with uh, four children, uh, my daughter-in-law with three children. Uh, their kids are up early and they're at it. So I'm empathetic, but I nevertheless encourage you to get up early. It says, in the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch 
For you're not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. And he goes through this uh, talking about, uh, uh, just points some things out. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. Look at this. You hate all who do iniquity. You know, we have this phrase in the church that's really a lie. That God loves the sinner but hates the sin. It's not true. It says you hate all iniquity. We're going to see a similar verse later in chapter or Psalm 11, I think. But God hates people who do wrong, hates the sinner. It's hard to get our minds around that because we've heard that phrase, God hate, loves the sinner and hates the sin so much. But God hated sin so much that Jesus himself, God himself in the flesh, had to go to the cross in order to pay for that sin. That's how much God hates sin. That God would not turn away from sin, that he would not ignore it, that he would not take the sinner and say, oh, tisk tisk tisk, boys will be boys and girls will be girls, I'll just look the other way. No, every sin has got to be paid for and atoned for before a righteous God because he hates all who do iniquity. That's why Jesus came. That's what propitiation is all about. God turns from hating to being, it's kind of an old word, propitious, favorable. He turns from being hateful and wrathful to loving the sinner. And Jesus is the way that that happens by placing your faith and trust in him. So don't, don't discount the cross. Don't discount or minimize the value of the cross. God, it says here, hates all who do, does iniquity. It's only by the propitiating work of Christ that that hate is turned to love. Let's drop down to verse 8, our highlight verse here. O Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. Let's highlight and explain this a little bit. So lead me. Interesting uh, thing God, David asks for here to be led. David was in need of God's leading. He was always in need of God's leading. Always being uh, needful of being led in righteousness because David, like us, was a sinful man. And without leading in righteousness, he would wander off into sinfulness. It's particularly important right now because of my foes, David says. Uh, when, you know, when you're surrounded by people who um, wish you ill, when once, uh, in David's case, you can imagine people that were um, gossiping about him, people who were destroying his reputation, people who were literally trying to kill him, his own son trying to steal the um, kingdom from him through a coup. You can imagine how with all this going on, David might have been distracted. He might have been looking for the easy way, how to get even. How to, get, how to eliminate his enemies. He could have marched into that cave where Saul was sleeping and run uh, a uh, pike, a spear, a battle spear through Saul, but he didn't. He didn't because God was leading him in righteousness. So that's what he's asking for here. Make your way straight before me. Lord, show me the way to go. So that brings us to who is the man that God uses? Well, we see in David here, I think, a model of what that man is. And in verses 1 through 3, we can say from that that he sought God's guidance. He sought God's guidance first at the beginning of the day, at the start of the day. He didn't want to get to the end of the day and look back and see how God should have, would have guided him, or perhaps what he should have done in retrospect, no, he's at the beginning of the day before he begins his day and he's asking God to lead him and guide him in the way of righteousness, that straight way at the beginning of the day. 
in verses 4 through 6, notice David's really high view of God's holiness in verses 4 through 6. You are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. He has no pleasure in wickedness. He's intolerant of evil. God destroys the boastful. What a, what a huge, high view of God's holiness that David has right here. The man that God uses is not only seeking God's guidance at the beginning of the day, but he has a very high view of God's holiness. He not only hates sin and the sinner, those who sin, but his fact it says he destroys all who speak falsely. He destroys them. Now we know in the fullness of revelation that this destruction that they suffer is a destruction that is ongoing. It's a destruction by being consigned to the eternal torments of hell. Will it be tortured by Satan's demons under the eye of God? who is not blind to what happens in hell. He has a very high view of God. So the man who God uses seeks God. He has a high view of God's holiness. In verse 7, he's a humble man. By your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. By God's loving kindness, not by David's righteousness, not by his goodness, not because he deserves it, not because he's king, but because of God and because God loves him. And this loving kindness um, is translating a Hebrew word, hesed. Hesed is this covenant love, this promise of love that God will not go back on. That's why David can come before God. Not because he's good, but because God is good. Verse 8, again, it's leadability, it's submissiveness to the Lord. It's being ready to bow your knee, to learn from God, to learn from his word, to follow that straight path that, lays, that God lays out before him. In verse 10, he looks to God for judgment. Hold them guilty, O Lord. David is not going to uh, take matters into his own hands. He is asking God to intervene here. So just to recap, who is the man that God uses? What's this psalm teaching us, David's example? He's a man who seeks God first. He's a man who has a very high view of God's holiness. He's a humble man, depending on the Lord himself. He's a leadable, submissive man, bowing his knee to the revelation that God's given. In verse 10, he's the one who puts his vindication, he puts judgment in the hands of God. So by way of application, how do you line up with these things? I, I mean, I'm searching my own soul and see areas where I have to have a very a higher view of God, perhaps. Uh, maybe I need to trust God for my vindication and look to him for judgment more than I do. How about you? Take a few minutes. Do a careful, spirit-guided self-examination. You don't need to show your self-examination to anybody else. Just be honest with yourself and be honest before the Lord. And then in terms of response, let me encourage you, pick one of these things and start small, right? Pick something, an area that you come up short and turn to God in prayer as we come to the end here and ask him to give you conviction in this area. Ask him to give you deep conviction and the spiritual strength that you need to grow. And brothers and sisters, I can say from my own personal experience, I'm definitely not cooked on both sides, don't get me wrong, but I am growing and that pleases the Lord. And if you're growing, it'll please the Lord as well. So he'll give you the spiritual strength that you need to be growing. It's his will. It's his desire for you. And he is not going to hold back on what you need. In fact, it says in 2 Peter that he has given us everything we need for both life and godliness. Everything. So he won't hold back if we ask for the spiritual strength and conviction 
to grow in the areas that we are weak. Take it to heart, brothers and sisters. Apply this. Respond to the Lord. God bless you.